All right, this is Pastor Adam Fannin with Law of Liberty Baptist Church. Uh, We traveled all the way up to Georgia to catch up with Brother Jake Strickland. We want to talk about some of the main points about once saved, always saved. When we're going into the prison or the jails around here and we're, we're preaching to them, Giving them the gospel is, is, is you only have one hour and you're inside and that might seem like a, a long time, but when you're talking to 20 or 30 people at one time, a lot of people have questions. So my approach is I like to give the gospel, uh, you know, the death, burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the first five to 10 minutes. And, and everybody's heard that. We live in the deep south in the Bible Belt. Everybody knows the gospel already. They know the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Most people that we're preaching to are self-professing Christians already. But the, the hang-up parts is really when we get into eternal security. And when we're trying to really convince them that once they put their faith in Christ, they are saved forever, and there's nothing, absolutely nothing they can do to lose their salvation. And I just start hitting them with verses. And I use the remainder of that hour just to hammer down eternal security, nail it down for them so that they are convinced that once that all they need to do is put their faith in Christ, and then they are, they are saved to the uttermost. There's nothing they can do to lose it. And I start giving them all these verses but oftentimes I would have people come up to me and say, can you give me those verses again? And in the jails and the prisons, they, 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 they have like what would look like an exploded pen. They have only the ink tube so they can't stab somebody in the neck. And they're trying to scribble down on a, on a small little napkin these little verses that I'm giving them. And I say, hey, I tell you what, I'll, I'll bring you back a printout. So I went home one day and I started you know, putting as many eternal security verses as I could on a sheet of paper. We can't take anything inside the jail that has staples or gym clips or anything like that. Or uh, So we, we can't bring like uh, anything that I'd like to take. So I had to get it all on one sheet of paper. And I have, you know, about 26 reasons why you cannot lose your salvation. And also on the back, 25 reasons, you know, why you are wrong if you think you can lose your salvation. And it kind of goes through a lot of these verses. It's got the reference to all these verses. So uh, on my way into the jail, I start handing these out and we discuss it while we're in there. And we talk to all the inmates as we go through them. And I think it's a, a pretty good, uh, you know, there, there's just no way out of it. These are clear verses. They're They're powerful. And I figure, you know, just getting them into their hands on our way out the door is a lot better than them scribbling on a, a little napkin while we're in there with their busted up pens. So I think we're going to just go over a few of these with you guys now. So. Yeah, this is a great tool, and I've borrowed it from him and modified it to make it my own a little bit and change the font. And uh, so we're going to make sure that you guys have a copy of this, that it's available for you to use in your own way. We mail these out to people and when we give out free bumper stickers, and I hand them out as well. And um, I think it's a great tool because once saved, always saved is really probably the, the biggest issue. I think it's the primary thing. There are a lot of people that understand that Jesus died for their sins, and yet they're somehow unconfident. They feel like there's something they could do to lose their salvation. So I would say they're not saved. They don't have assurance that it's totally on Christ. They're still trusting on themselves. Eternal security is the essential doctrine of preaching the gospel because once you're fully persuaded, as the Bible says, then you're no longer living in jeopardy every hour. You're trusting in Christ. You understand He finished the work and now the Holy Spirit moves in to help you to begin to clean up your life and work on those areas that God has for you. So we're going to talk about this and I hope this is a blessing and uh, let's just get started. We'll start with point number one. If you believe in the doctrine of eternal security or if you believe in once saved, always saved, then you believe, according to the scriptures, that you are justified from all things. Acts 13, 39 says, And by him all that believe are justified from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So if you're saved, you're already justified from all things. There's nothing that can condemn you in this world after you're saved. So Wayne, I have to interject. When, when you see that it says all things, are you a literalist? you believe that means 
All things. All means all. Amen. All things, yeah. Exactly. You are justified from all things. So if somebody says you can still lose your salvation, what would you have to do to lose your salvation? Because they would have to now, they're, they're going to have to violate this scripture and say, well, if you do this, you're going to lose your salvation. Well, I guess that is not covered when it says all things you're justified from. So they're, they're, they're really just violating the scripture there. So you are justified from all things the moment you put your faith in Christ. Uh, you're eternally secure. Number two, if you believe in the doctrine of eternal security, and I'm not going to try to say that every time, but number two is, if you do believe in the doctrine of eternal security, you do not need to keep the law to be saved. The Bible says in Acts 15, 24, and this is kind of on the same vein of Acts 13, 39, but Acts 15, 24, the Bible says, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your soul, saying, ye must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. You do not have to keep the law to be saved. And, and even back in the Apostle Paul's time, he was dealing with this and, and putting that to bed from uh, the folks who still tried to keep to the law to, to, in order to keep themselves pure and, and to earn their ticket into heaven. So you do not need to keep the law to be saved. And, and that goes right into verse uh, point three. All things are lawful to you but not all are expedient. And we're referencing 1 Corinthians 6.12 where the Apostle Paul says exactly that. And, so, and again, he says it in chapter 10 and verse 23. All things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient. What does that mean? I can do anything I want, but it's not. It's not a good idea to just go out and sin willfully. I'm going to incur the judgment of God in my life, and that is not a good idea. That's like if my son was to walk up to me and say, Dad, you mean I can, I can do anything I want to and you're still going to love me? I'm still going to be your son? I can disrespect you and, and disobey you? I would say, sure, son, I'm still going to love you. You're still my son, but you're going to have a miserable life. If you think you can just, you know, disobey and disrespect me and, and not abide by my rules, you're still going to be my son. You'll always be my son. I'll always love you, but you're going to have a, oh, a terrible life if that's how you want to live. So, yeah, everything is lawful to you, old Christian man, but not all things are expedient. It's not good for you. Number four, even if you teach other men to break the least of these commandments, you are still saved, but you're considered least in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus was saying to the Christian man that goes out and tells other people to break God's laws, he's considered least in the kingdom of heaven, but nevertheless, he's still in the kingdom of heaven. So, you know, if people said, well, you can lose your salvation by sinning, what would they say if you said, well, what if I want to just go out and not only sin myself, but I want to I want to teach others how to be a good sinner. I, uh, you know, I want to teach them how to break the law more efficiently. I'm going to teach them to sin, then I'm still saved, according to Jesus. But according to them, I've lost my salvation on my own sins. Nevertheless, teaching others how to sin. So, Number five, you are a new creature in Christ. You know, but your sinful flesh is still present. And that's the famous verse in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away. All things are become new. And so we are a new creature in Christ. And here's the rub, though. Our sinful flesh is still with us, and we are still going to be tempted to sin. We're still going to be tempted to take that second look at the billboard of the bikini babe that we're not supposed to look at, that's going to be ever present with us until the day we die. And we have to fight against that flesh every day of our life. And we have to, we have to slay that old man as often as he rears his ugly head, which in my case is every day of my life. So number six, you are born again and you cannot sin, but your flesh can so that kind of piggybacks off of number five. But you are born again and you cannot sin. You know, in 1 John chapter, five, uh, chapter 3, 
verses like 8, 9, and 10, the Bible says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And a new Christian might read that and say, what do you mean I, I don't sin anymore? Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. You might say to yourself, well, I still sin every day. Am I not saved? Am I not born of God? And no, you are saved. You are born again, but your flesh is not saved. Your flesh is still going to die. Your flesh is not given eternal life. So your flesh can still sin. That's why the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 7, the second half of the chapter, he's admitting to his sin problems and the things he doesn't want to do, he ends up doing and the things that he, he, uh, he, he wants to do, he ends up avoiding and, and not accomplishing. So he's, if the Apostle Paul can struggle with sin, you can too, O Christian man. And um, that's what it's saying here. So in 1 John chapter 3, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, and he cannot sin. Because his seed, Christ's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. So, tell me this. If you could lose your salvation, how? If you're, if you're a spirit man, your new man cannot sin, how can he be condemned for never sinning? It's impossible for him to sin. But your flesh will die. Your flesh is going to be uh, dead one day. And thank God you'll be free from the... Uh, from the uh, urge to sin ever again. All right, number seven. You will in no wise be cast out of God's family. You know, it would be a terrible father if he walked into his house one day and he saw his kids acting up and they are all disobeying him and, and uh, he just opens the door and says, all right, you don't want to obey me? Hit the road, Jack. And he just sends them right on out the door and says, don't ever come back home. You're, you're no longer a part of this family. That would be a terrible father. Instead, he will correct his children because he loves them, but in no way will he cast them out. Jesus said in John 3, uh, 6, 37, he says, all that the father giveth to me shall come to me and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Now, this is a great place to add, you know, John 1, 12, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So we're adopted into the family by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3, verse 26 tells us we are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And then once you're in the family, he'll never kick you out of the family. Uh, but believe me, he will correct his children. So uh, that is the warning that goes along with eternal security. As you know, he's always there to help you lead you, guide you, and of course, correct you, and then comfort after the correction. That's exactly right. And that leads us to number eight, that then you must trust that the children of God are not appointed unto wrath. And that comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 9. It says, For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So, you are not appointed under wrath. God's never going to put his wrath on you. He will put his wrath on the world and the lost and the unsaved and the reprobates and all of them, but not to his children. His children will be corrected. They'll be chastised while they're still living, but they will not be appointed under wrath. All right, number nine, you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Present tense, right now. Ephesians uh, chapter 2 and verse 6 and seven, six through 7 tells us in the present tense, even while we are still walking this earth, we are already seated with Christ and we are already established in His kingdom. I don't know what that looks like. Maybe, I mean, God sees things for how they are and a future event as, as how they are, but it says in Ephesians chapter 2, Verse 6, it says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is all present tense. I don't know if it's just a big long table up there and there's a, a placeholder with my name on it, but I've got a seat at the table of Christ and I'm pretty excited about that. I don't know. Number 10, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 
That is Philippians 1, 6. It doesn't say that he might not perform it. He will perform it. He's going to see you through. It says in Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm going to jump in and do number 11. This is one of my favorites. It says, ye are sealed by the Holy Ghost unto the day of redemption. Until the day that you're resurrected, the Holy Spirit has sealed you and you are protected and preserved in Jesus Christ. You're eternally sealed. That's his promise. Number 12, you can make it to heaven with absolutely no works. After you get saved, of course, but you will arrive as by fire. You will have nothing to show for it. Even the clothes off your back are pretty much burned off. You've absolutely walked into heaven naked if you have no works, but you're still in heaven, all right? You do not have to have any works. And I'm basing that off of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15, where the Bible reads, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Number 13, if you're saved, you can fall into such sin that you get handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Nevertheless, your spirit is saved. This is an important concept. The Bible warns us about a sin unto death for the Christian. So once you're saved, you can go live like hell if you want to, but God will correct you. He may kill you and bring you home early. His desire is that you would follow in obedience and begin to purge your life work out your salvation, begin to look more like a Christian and live for him, then he'll reward you and bless you and protect you. But if you don't, you guarantee God can turn your body over to Satan and Satan will kill you. He'll infect your body and destroy you while you're here on the earth. Let's double tap that one. Go ahead. So 1 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm basing that off of the fact that the, the, Corinth, the church at Corinth had a man there who was in the church who was saved and he was living in fornication with his father's wife. And the Apostle Paul found out about it. And his instruction to the church was kick him out. Get him out of the church and hand him over to Satan. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. He says that his flesh may be destroyed by, by Satan, but his soul may be saved. So we are saved even after we get kicked out of the church and continue a life of sin. You cannot lose your salvation. Number 14, you are chastised by the Lord when you do commit sin after you get saved because he loves you. Hebrews 12, 6, we've all heard that. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. Because he loves you, he will correct you when you sin. Number 15, you have the promise of God and you shall not come into condemnation, right? We've been passed from death unto life, John 5, 24. Uh, you will never perish. You shall never die. We have eternal life or everlasting life. Those are the promises of John 5, 24 and John 3, 16. Once you're saved, you eternally are secure forever, but the body will still perish. It's the soul that is secure. Amen. And we have the promise of God. If God were to break his promise, that would make him a liar. And Titus 1, 2 says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. And he cannot lie. He cannot break his promise. He's given us eternal life. He is not an Indian giver. He will not take that back. The Bible says in, in Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. All right, number 16, you are in Christ's hand and in the Father's hand, and you are the apple of his eye. Basing that off of John chapter 10 and uh, verse 28 through 29, it's pretty much straightforward. It, it says the exact same thing. I'm just paraphrasing that. So we'll move right on into point 17. Christ will never leave you nor forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5 is famous for that. Once you're filled with the Holy Spirit, once you're a child of God, once you're adopted in the family by faith in Christ Jesus, you're always in the family. He's always present with you, even while you're sinning. And that ought to be the, the, the thing to remember. That's why we should cast down imaginations and begin to work on our life because he's always right there with us. Let's not put him to an open shame. If you do sin, number 18, if you do sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. That comes right out of 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He says, 
He tells us, don't sin. But if you do sin, you've got an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Now, check this out. The judge is Jesus. The judge is God. But at the same time, if you're saved, the judge is your defense attorney. You've got nothing to worry about. He is right there on your side. He, he's going to help you through that legal system. No worries. Okay, the judge is your defense. Number 19, it says, where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. This is referencing Romans 5.20 that says just that. So when you sin more, well, God's grace is applied more. Now, we know when you get to the next chapter, he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. So should you stay the same way you were? No, God forbid. He wants to give you the Holy Spirit to help change you. But salvation is free. It's a gift that's grace from God and we get it just by faith in Jesus Christ. We should have great assurance in what He's finished, and we don't depend on ourselves to keep ourselves saved. Otherwise, we're all in trouble. Number 20, the Bible says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22, it says, Who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Uh, we have been given the earnest of the Spirit like a down payment of what's to fully come. And God is not going to lose the Spirit. He puts the Spirit into us. He's not going to just neglect us after that. We will eventually inherit all that God has in store for our lives. Now, number 21, you have here, salvation is a free gift, not a reward. This is very important. And you have Romans 6.23 and Ephesians 2.8.9 referenced here. Now, Romans 6.23 is my favorite verse. Uh, the wages of sin is death, right? What we have earned for breaking God's law is hell. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So God wants to give you a free gift. It's called everlasting life. It lasts forever. And we only get it through Jesus. He was the Son of Man. Christ, He's our only Savior and Messiah. And He is the Lord. He is God. He's our Creator. So these verses together really just put a nail in the coffin because Ephesians 2 says the same thing, that we're saved by grace. We're saved through faith, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we can't brag that we've earned it. It's totally free, and we get it through Jesus Christ. So I was going to say this. I think a lot of people have a Santa Claus mentality of God, and they think, you know, in order to get a present or a gift from Santa, which is not a gift, it's a reward. Santa only brings a reward to you if you've been good and you've earned one or if you deserve one. And so I think, you know, a lot of people think about God like Santa Claus. If you want to go to heaven, you better earn it. It's, it's a reward, but it's not. It's a free gift. It doesn't cost you a dime. Only your simple faith and trust in Christ. All right, moving along, we are at number 22. You trust that the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. We've already said that, Romans eleven twenty nine 29, for the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Once he gives you something, he's not going to take it back. You can rest assured there. He's not a liar. He's not an Indian giver, whatever you want to call him. He is not that. 23, so God will not impute to you future sins. And your past sins are, are forgiven already. So... That comes straight out of Romans chapter 4 and is quoting David saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven. That's past tense. Your past sins are already forgiven and whose sins are covered. That's right here, right now. The sins that I commit today, right now, are already covered under the blood. And verse 8, Romans 4, 8. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sins. That's my future sin. They will not be put on my account. So they will be perishing with my flesh, my old man in the ground. They will not be put on my new man's record. You think about it, this is good news. I mean, this is what gospel means. The good news is Jesus didn't just open the door and wish you luck and hope you can earn it the rest of the way. He paid for it all, all the way to the end of your life. Your sins have been paid for past, present, and future, all the sins that you did that you've forgotten about, paid for. All the sins that you've done you hope no one finds out about, paid for. And whatever you're going to do today, tomorrow, and the rest of your life, as long as you're in this old body, this sinful flesh, praise the Lord, they've been paid for. 
Amen. And the Bible says in Psalm 103, verse 12, it says, Your sins are forgotten and cast as far as from the east is to the west. Your sins will never be brought back up before you again. You won't have to answer for them. You're only going to be judged on your works for God that you've done for him and his service after you've gotten saved. But he's not going to call you down to the carpet and ask you why you committed such and such sin on such and such date at this time and that time. He's not going to, that is all on the old man's account. It's already been put away from you. He's only going to judge you based on what you've done for him in eternity for his service back on the earth. So that's what that means. Number, that's number 24. Number 25, nothing presently nor anything coming in the future shall be able to separate you from the love of God. This is the promise that we see in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And he loved the world so much that he died for the sins of the whole world. All of your sins have already been paid for, and no amount of additional sin can separate you from God's love. No persecution or tribulation or affliction. The devil can't separate you. You can't separate yourself. God loves you. He paid for all your sins. What a blessing. Last one on the list is number 26. If you believe in the doctrine of eternal security, if you believe in once saved, always saved, then you must be very thankful that Jesus would save a miserable sinner just like you and welcome you into his heavenly kingdom. In 2 Corinthians 9 verse 15, it says, Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Amen. What an unspeakable gift. You think about it. He's done so much for me. I don't even know where to begin. Uh, it's such a magnitude of grace that he's given me. It is unspeakable. Now, I'm going to talk about it. And I'm going to praise him for it. But there are ways that I don't even understand that he's loved me and the gift that he's given to me. I won't see it all until I'm with him and I see him in glory. What a beautiful thing. Amen. So, you know, if you're wondering, if you watch this and you're not saved, if you're wondering how to be saved, it's easy. Paul writes about the simplicity of the gospel. It's easy enough. A caveman can understand it. Just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Acts 16, 31. Just put your trust in him. Amen. If you have any questions about hard verses, I've done a little series of YouTube shorts about once saved, always saved, and I've given those references. But if you have any questions, leave those below, and we will do our best to address this in our next video. So thank you for watching. And uh, Brother Jake, thanks for having us up here in Georgia. And pray for us as we go into the prisons to preach the gospel to the lost. Yes. God bless. See you later.